And he got his BS from the Kent University uh, in 2013. Uh, he got his MS from Stanford in 2019, and uh, he's actively performing uh, his PhD study. Today, he will be talking on interactive uh, autonomy for uh, making robots to learn. Uh, Interaction capability with, with humans or uh, artists. So, welcome, Adam. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, yeah, I'm a fifth year PhD student that I'm working with Social Study at Stanford. And today I'm going to talk about how we learn preferences uh, for interactive autonomy, especially for human robot interaction in, in all the agency systems. Um, so, before I start uh, defining the problem that I'm trying to solve, I want to show you some examples of how humans act in multi agent systems. Uh, this is an example uh, from a volleyball team. And in this video, I want you to focus on uh, this player. Okay, sorry about that. Um, yeah, as I was saying, I want to start with showing some examples of how humans act in multi agent systems. Um, and in this video, I want you to focus on this player. So let's watch. So he successfully bumps the ball. And at this moment, it seems almost obvious that this other player is going to spike the ball and try to make a score. But look at our player. He just bumped the ball, but he's like preparing to jump again, even though he cannot hit the ball without like, before someone else does. And let's see what happens next. Oops. That was a little quick. Let's watch it in slow motion. So as you can see, that other player sets the ball for our player, and our player makes this slide jump. And but overall, we are seeing a great cooperation between these two players here. And this is really the key moment here. Like at this moment, this other player has two options. He will either set the ball or he will fight. Similarly, our player had two options. He will either wait or he will jump. These players have trained together so many times that our player can predict the other agent is going to set the ball for him. And so he decides to jump. And overall, he saw that great score. But this is much more challenging in human robot interaction because humans are hard to predict. For example, in this case, uh, the robot couldn't predict the human is going to go for the green, uh, green cup, and so it also tried to pick up that one. Um, and yeah, the problem is we often don't know what humans want to do. And even if we know that, we don't know how, uh, how well humans are to optimize, humans are uh, optimizing uh, these kind of objectives. So in my PhD, what I'm trying to do is to make AI agents anticipate other actions. And the way I'm trying to do this is by um, having AI agents learn what the humans are trying to do. So I'm trying to learn their objectives or reward functions or another one. So for this, I'm like focusing on three different things. One is human robot interaction, um, but the agent the robot is trying to interact with doesn't need to be a human. It can be another robot or it can be another AI agent. So I also look at multi robots or in general multi agents. And after we learn these um, reward functions or objectives of the other agents, we actually want to use this information for like, different objectives, for example, slam. Uh, like using the objective that I learned for the other agents, I want to use that in my pipeline to better plan my actions or goals. So I've been doing research on these three different fields in my PhD. And today I'm going to focus on uh, mostly the human learning. So I want to learn the human's objectives. And at the end, I will briefly talk about the work that we did on kind of an intersection between these three. Uh, so how can we use these human models to better plan uh, our policies in the benefit? And uh, although 
most of the time I'm going to talk about human robot collaboration and examples to include this. Uh, these ideas are applicable in many different uh, domains, so for example, recommendation systems or in like exoskeleton gate optimization or uh, traffic optimization uh, by like routing gates. Okay, so I will divide this problem into three categories. First, I'm going to look at the learning part. So how can we use the information we acquire from humans to learn their objectives or reward decisions? Uh, because humans can give us different forms of data. Two of them are comparisons and benchmarks. And then I'm going to move to the second part, which I call elicitation. So in this part, I'm going to talk about how the robot can elicit this information uh, from the human. So by, for example, asking questions to the human, we can elicit better uh, or higher quality information from the human. And this is an active learning problem. Finally, I'll talk about interaction. So this is a multi-agent system and using the models that I learned for the human, uh, I want to better plan my policy and specifically I'm going to talk about multi-agent contexts. Let's start with the learning problem. So one very common way to learn human objectives is learning from demonstrations. Human gives the human gives a demonstration and based on the demonstration, we learn a policy or reward function for that. For example, this idea of uh, behavioral cloning has been around for uh, more than 30 years now. And it works great in many settings. For example, people use it for driving. And, uh, but the problem is we often need something in addition to behavioral cloning. For example, we, in our work, uh, the one in the middle here, uh, we needed to train multiple policies and we had to learn how to optimally switch between them. Or in this last work, uh, Shen et al., they needed additional safety controllers on top of the behavioral plan. But what's the problem here? Why can't we just imitate, uh, like imitate the human and learn a perfect driving policy? Um, to see why, uh, let's look at Bayesian RL in a, in a, from a mathematical perspective. So in Bayesian RL, we are given a set of demonstrations. Um, and we have some trajectory features. For example, um, let's say we have this task where we have a robot and the robot is trying to uh, reach, a, reach a not group on the table without colliding with obstacles. So uh, for example, in this case, the trajectory features can be like how close the arm gets to the not group uh, or how close it gets to the obstacle or its average speed, et cetera. The assumption in Bayesian RL is that the reward function is a function of these features. For example, it can be a linear function of these features. And what we need to do is to learn these uh, linear weight vector W. Okay. And how do we do this? Um, well, we just use Bayes rule. So what we want to do is to like learn this posterior over W given a demonstration theta by T. Uh, so for example, we can take the maximum of the uh, posterior to get the map estimate, or we can take its expectation. Uh, so by using phase rule, we can write that this, so we have a prior, uh, it can be a very, it, it can be an un, uninformative prior, but uniform prior, or we can put some domain knowledge in it. It's, it's, it's not that important. The more important part is the second part, because this likelihood term is how we incorporate the information from demonstrations into our model. And to model this, what we do is we first assume the trajectories are conditionally independent from each other, which is fine. And then this next assumption is that humans are noisily optimal. So uh, depending on the exponential of the trajectory's rewards, the humans are more likely to take that uh, or demonstrate that trajectory. The problem is this assumption generally doesn't hold, especially in robotics. Because for example, the trajectory that I'm showing on the right here with the robot, it's an optimal trajectory. But there is almost no way humans give this demonstration because Humans cannot teleoperate the robot as soon as it is. In fact, you can see a video of my lab mate, Andy, and Andy has a lot of experience with this robot. And he's trying to complete this task by like, teleoperating the robot. And you'll see that he, he, he cannot get to the notebook exactly. Like, at, 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 at some point, it gets stuck and it just ends there. But is it because he's using keyboard? We also tried with the uh, joystick. Uh, that's a problem. And the, and, and the reason is, I think the main reason is this robot has seven degrees of freedom in, in this arm. And even with a joystick, the mod like we can get is four degrees of freedom. So we need to switch between controllers. Uh, and so it becomes really hard to control that robot. 
And like I think this is this is a common problem in many robotics applications, how nice we have a very like low dimension like that. And uh, this, this is not specific to like these robot arms. So for example, there is this work where they show people don't like their own drive. They think it's too aggressive. Or more recently, we showed that when risk is involved in a scenario, humans are consistently making suboptimal decisions because of the either like risk seeking behavior or risk alert behavior, depending on how risky the situation is. How about haptic robots on the right hand side? Haptic robots? Uh, I think with haptic robots, it might be okay. The, unless there are some problems with the like motor senses or the like, motor, uh, like, motor muscles. <laughs> um, but yeah, overall, the problem is like, if we are not able to give good demonstrations to these robots, how can we even hope to learn from these demonstrations? So our idea is to use comparative feedback to learn these objectives. And uh, so let me start with comparisons. Then I say comparative feedback, it can be like comparisons, rankings, or uh, some other forms that I'm going to briefly talk about, but I'll start with comparisons. So what I mean by comparison data is that the robot shows two different, two different trajectories to the uh, human. And then we ask the human whether they prefer trajectory A or trajectory B. So the human is not controlling the robot anymore. The robot does two different things, and then the human just tells us uh, their preference. Now, how do we add this into the Bayesian RL framework? Well, we now have two different data sets. Uh, B is still for demonstrations. And then now we have C uh, for comparisons. And comparison data consist of three tuples. So we have trajectory A, trajectory B, and then Q is the response of the user, whether they prefer trajectory A or trajectory B. Uh, we still have the same trajectory features. Um, so in the in the in the base uh, formulation, now we are going to have two given data sets, B and C. Uh, similarly, we can assume these data sets are condition independent, and each comparison uh, is also conditional independent. Now, in this last step, we are again make the we are, we are again making the same assumption that humans are noisily optimal in comparisons. So the probability that I choose a trajectory over another trajectory is proportional to the exponential of the reward of that trajectory. So this is what this is saying. But this assumption doesn't hurt us here because it's not the humans who control the robot anymore. Humans are just watching the trajectories and they're just making side changes. So they are not uh, bound by the, the human suboptimality or cognitive bias or, or like inability to control the high dimensional robots. So like with this framework, like we now have this final posterior that we can maximize or we can take the expectation. And this way we can get an estimate of W, which is the parameter for the reward function. Um, so we tried this. Uh, on the left is the Bayesian arrow with demonstrations. On the right is ours with demonstrations and comparisons. And so to make this fair, uh, we made it such that the learning rate is the same between the two in the simulation. So, on the left one, we have many demonstrations, and on the right one, we have a few demonstrations and comparisons. And as you can see, the Bayesian RL robot gets stuck while trying to avoid the obstacle because it learns the weight for avoiding the obstacle is really high, so it just tries to maximize that. It, it cannot reach the goal. Uh, whereas ours also doesn't hit the obstacle, but can actually reach the goal because it learned a better reward function. How does it learn avoiding obstacle? Like, what is exactly like? I mean, do you have it? Some kind of penalty, like in case of right. So uh, the, the trajectory features we have is like during training, do we provide like some feedback on that or not? Uh, so we are not explicitly providing feedback about avoiding uh, avoid obstacles, but uh, we have these trajectory features. So then we say like we like this trajectory better than the other one. We are actually giving some feedback about the obstacle avoidance rate. So we are giving feedback about all of them like aggregately. But uh, it, it's not explicitly for like it's, it's not feature by feature. Do you mind explaining the type is better and avoid the obstacle? Not, for example, using some potential field and stuff like that. Yeah, we're not using any potential field. Like human, like human is not saying this avoided the obstacle better. Human just says, I like this trajectory more than the other one. So, so it's, it's not an ob obstacle avoidance. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's not, it's not. So it's like, it's an overall feedback. It's, it's not feature by feature. So how do you panic to that? Yeah, I was gonna say still I can't see the unit penalty. Like where where is the penalty unit? 
Like what penalty that you're providing, like avoiding the robot to keep track. Correct. So, what? so, so, it's so preference, like, right? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's preference data. So, like, what happens is, um, like, they have one, let's say I gave you two trajectories, and one of them gets really close to the obstacle, the other one doesn't, and there are like other features too. So, the robot knows those features. But it doesn't know which feature is more important or which feature needs to be so maximized. You, assume you know the obstacle location. Yes, it knows the obstacle location. But then the problem is easy. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, okay. In the, in, in the next part, I'm going to talk about how we can have nonlinear functions. So in that way, you don't need to make like ex, ex, uh, explicitly encode the obstacle. Uh, but yeah, in this part, the reward is linear. Uh, in this feature, then the features are. Because we can implement potential feedback system interface. Easily we right. can avoid. If you add the potential to uh, it's easy to avoid both. Well, but the problem is you it's it's difficult, it's still difficult to learn the trade-off between avoiding the obstacle or getting the not good or like speed. So there's that trade-off, and that's what we're trying to learn. Thank you. So yeah, the, the key takeaway here is that this comparison data can be combined with demonstrations to learn reward functions. And I've been doing like many works on this. Um, so here, uh, here is a list of them. And I'll very briefly talk about this. Uh, so for example, with the comparison data, one advantage is that it's the robot who decides what to ask. So we can actually optimize those questions and we can actively learn, uh, actively learn the reward functions. And I'm going to very briefly talk about this data in the talk too. Uh, but the problem with that is if the robot tries to optimize each and every question, it takes, it takes a very long time. The robot needs to optimize the question, it asks it, and then the human waits again. Uh, it, it, it takes really long. So what we did is we also developed batch active methods uh, so that we can collect data in parallel and it, it's also faster. Um, and there are also like more, uh, like there are richer forms of comparative feedback. One of them is scale feedback. So what happens in scale feedback is that now human can say how much they prefer one trajectory to, over the other. And this contains one information, so it makes learning faster. Um, another form of comparative feedback is hierarchical queries. Uh, in hierarchical queries, the system starts from an initial state. We ask a comparison question, and depending on the user's response, we start. We make the next comparison question start from that state, and in this way, we can learn some simple uh, non-stationary pieces of reward function. And we recently released a, a Python library for doing like most of these things. Uh, so in, in that library, you can like customize the different question types, active learning optimizations, etc. If you think that that can be useful in your research, let us know and we can discuss offline. Um, and these preference-based learning or comparison-based learning uh, have like applications outside of this field. For example, we can use that to reduce traffic congestion. So how do we do that? Uh, so we have this Uber and Lyft. Uh, the idea in Uber and Lyft is they give you multiple options with different prices, and depending on how much you pay, you get like extra comfort, extra capacity, etc. Uh, and based on that data, it's it's actually preference data because it's giving you four different options and you're choosing one. So it can actually learn your uh, trade-off between price and latency. And by learning that price and latency, we combine that with the traffic network information. And we can better optimize these prices in Uber, and we can like reduce congestion uh, significantly. These are all in simulation, but uh, those simulations are very big, so I'm assuming they will also work in real life. Uh, but then the pandemic happened, and we, we are all like staying at home, so we don't need to solve the traffic congestion anymore. There's no congestion. Uh, but the but the problem is with reopening, we realized. People are not using public transportation anymore. And that means they're using their private cars even more. So the congestion is actually increasing and it's going to increase to a point where it's actually worse than pre-pandemic. Uh, so we started to like inspect that and we added risk of infection to our model to show how like authorities can optimize uh, taxi fares or train fares to like, balance the trade-off between uh, risk of infection and congestion. Um, and finally, uh, as I said, the reward uh, need not be linear, so it can be modeled as a nonlinear function, or it can even be non-parametric. For example, it can be Gaussian process, um, and we can still do the Gaussian process regression with comparison data. 
and we use that for exoskeleton weight optimization. So the, the thing is here, uh, with these like lower body exoskeletons, people cannot give demonstrations because people who use these systems, uh, they're like patients. And the, the reason they are using these is they cannot move, so they cannot give demonstrations. But what we can do is we can collect their comparison data and we can learn their preference to maximize their comfort or safety. And uh, the active learning really helps here because collecting data from these patients are uh, really expensive. So data is really expensive. And this active learning uh, improves data efficiency. So, so yeah, we have these uh, bunch, of, bunch of works on learning uh, from comparisons. Uh, and today I'm going to uh, talk about a more expressive form of feedback, which is rankings. But to do that, let me first uh, define the Greater is a problem. So we have a robot and we have a human. The human has a reward function in mind. The robot doesn't know that. Um, and the goal of the robot is to learn the human's reward function. For example, let's say we, are, we have an autonomous driving car. So we have this red car here and it wants to turn left. So it starts turning. And then at some point, it realizes the blue car, which was previously located behind the red truck. So it can take different actions now. If it's learned it's policy from a timid driver, let's say using comparisons, it can avoid the accidents by slowing down and letting the blue car pass first. So it can stop uh, without colliding. This is scenario one. Another possibility is maybe it learned the driving from an aggressive driver. And what it can do is it can just accelerate and uh, complete the turn before the blue driver, uh, blue car reaches the intersection. But in both of these cases, we assumed the car learned driving from a single driver. And there, there have been many works on learning from comparisons, and the reward function is in a model, uh, including most of the work I just described uh, in the previous slide. But what if the data, the reward function, is coming from multiple people with different preferences, different reward functions? And the robot doesn't know any of them. And the robot doesn't even know who provided the data. So in the driving example, it would be like, what if I have data from both types of drivers, both timid drivers and aggressive drivers? If we try to use these existing learning from comparison techniques, what happens is we try to find a policy that's close enough to both of the drivers and it's, it's a collision. So we cannot really do that. And the problem is learning reward functions from comparisons in the model case, um, it, it hasn't been studied before. And it's actually a more difficult problem. And let me maybe use another example to explain why. So we have this robot and the robot is trying to place this banana to one of the shelves. It, it doesn't know which shelf it prefer and it doesn't know how to put the banana. So first user comes in and says, I prefer the first trajectory. The robot can handle it because it knows how to do a minimal reward function. And then the second user comes in and gives an inconsistent preference. And now the robot is confused and it's going to fail. In fact, it's doomed to fail. And we, we have a nice counter example to show why it's doomed to fail. So this, uh, this is going to be a meta example. So we have two trajectories, psi1 and psi2. The first user comes in. Let's say the reward for the first trajectory for the first user is two, and for the second trajectory is one. So we again use these noisy optimal human model. So the probability of choosing trajectory one is proportional to the exponential of its rewards. And like under this model, the probability that the user chooses the first trajectory is 73%, and for the other ones, 27%. And then there's the second user with different rewards and preferences. And let's say 20% of the data comes from the first user and 80% comes from the second user. The robot, of course, does not. So at the end, we have this data set that's 24% of the 24% uh, in favor of the first trajectory and 76% in the second. Now, the problem is I can come up with another pair of users with different rewards and preferences such that with different data frequency parameters, I get the same data. So at the end, what our robot observes is this data set, which means it has no way of identifying between these three and three cases. These two cases are completely indistinguishable from our robot. And in fact, researchers in ranking theory, they proved they cannot learn multimodal reward functions using pairwise compared. Why is it called multimodal? 
uh, what's the meaning of modal indeed? So we have different modes. For example, in the driving case, we have an aggressive mode and a cumulative mode. So they have like there are two different reward functions. And the data is so in my understanding of multimodal is you have like a vision, auditory, uh, haptic, and right, so what is of data? That's, that's where it is used. Like, is it being also used in this uh, literature, like multimodal, or is that something you guys say? Yeah, so it's, it's it's being used because uh, it's like mathematically the function, the reward function, has multiple modes. Uh, but I, I can also call it mixture of rewards uh, because there okay, that makes more sense to me. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> I, I can just say mixture. Yeah, this, uh, yeah. Researchers in ranking theory, they proved we can observe mixtures of rewards uh, using pairwise comparisons. Uh, and it, it's, it's, it's like because of the counter example that I showed. Uh, so, are we done? No, because we can think of some generalizations of it. For example, instead of looking at pairwise comparisons, we can look at rankings, ranking of multiple trajectories. And that's what uh, I'm going to talk about now. Condition on the use of the user. Uh, so we don't know which user provided the data. So in the in, in the driving case, in the driving example, it could be done because we can probably have some like user ID for the data. Uh, but you can think of this as like there is one driver who is providing all the data, but it, they are driving this car in the morning and in the evening. So maybe in the evening they are more aggressive, in the morning they are more calm. So there are two different reward functions. Uh, but it's the same driver, so like you, you don't know which state they take. But, but how is that useful, right? That's why you said impossible because it's by nature it's a user pattern. So yeah, so yeah. But you can ask in an enterprise manner, you can try to understand the modes of the of the reward function. Maybe that's what you were trying to do. So in so in the unsupervised case where you don't have the, the user identities, it's impossible with pairwise comparisons. Like, no, but yeah, if you have user ID, then yeah, you can condition on the user, and so it's already like a single reward function, and then you can use that system now. It applies to the traffic problem, I think. How does it apply to the grasping problem as well? Uh, so, with the, again, like for example, if there are multiple tasks uh, and you don't have task ID, uh, then that means like you're trying to run a mixture of rewards. Actually, uh, I mean, uh, I forgot the meaning like that. The traffic problem uh, caused a collision because uh, the problem that you cannot, the model cannot learn whether the driver is timid or the aggressive. So the uh, uh, accumulative makes a collision for us. So right now on the robotic manipulation side, the piano is based on the eight, I guess, right? Yeah. yeah. So like if, like if there are two users, one prefers the middle shelf, the other prefers the top shelf. And if you are trying to do, like if you're trying to learn a unimodal reward function, then what's going to happen is it's going to try to like imitate both of them and there's a chance that it will just like interpolate them. So, 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 so. so that's again the same. Yeah, but yeah, like that that's again a problem. But like th this is all assuming we don't have user ID in the data. I think if you use force information, wouldn't that solve some of those problems? Like how much force they are applying on the length of the robot? Right, like it's a in, in, in some problems, like you you can add this additional information, and you can try to solve. It. But like, I think I'm talking about a more general problem here of just like learning from pairwise comparisons, and it, it's it's not specific to grasping or driving. Okay. So yeah, now I'm going to talk about learning from rankings. So yeah, later we have a robot, and the robot is going to now show multiple trajectories instead of two trajectories, like more than two trajectories now. And it's going to ask us to rank these trajectories from the best to the worst. We have multiple users uh, with different reward functions. Um, and uh, so I'm, I'm still going to use W for the parameters of the reward function, but it doesn't need to be linear. So it's just F W1 and F W2 for the second user. So we have two different Ws now. And one of them is going to respond to the query. So maybe the first user responds with probably the alpha one, and the second user uh, responds with probably the alpha two. But the robot doesn't know these alpha either. So formally, we are given a set of trajectory rankings that come from, that anonymously come from M humans, which may or may not have uh, different reward functions. And we are trying to learn the reward functions of these M humans. So let's say in this example, 
So the first user responds to this query. Again, the robot doesn't know this. So how does he answer? Um, it's going to be very similar to the softmax model. He will first know you choose this last option. So we again have this distribution uh, based on the exponential of the robots. And his first option will be a sample from this distribution. Let's say we chose uh, by one. And then next he's going to uh, choose his second best option. Now the first trajectory was already selected, so we dropped that. And it's going to be a sample from this remaining uh, distribution, of course, after normalization. Um, and then it's going to repeat for the third and the fourth trajectories. Is the user driving the robot in here? I don't no, it's, it's no robot shows trajectories from either a pre generated set or maybe some generated trajectories on the go. And then it just shows them, and then the robot says, This is the best, this is the best. What's the role of the user in here? I don't understand. Uh, so it's just giving its preferences of like which trajectory is better. He's just watching. Yeah, okay, just watching. So he's just looking at the kinematics and looking at the scene. Right. Okay. So it looks like the ending goal was to take three trajectories like this. So is it a part of the. Yeah, so in, in this case, what we like in this specific example, what we had as features that yeah, one of them is which shelter place. One of them is um, it's not visible in these pictures, but uh, like we are trying to place a banana. So where to grasp the banana is another feature. Um, and then where to leave it in the shelf is another feature. Uh, so like between, for example, these three, yeah, the shelves are different. And then in, for example, between two and four, like you can see that it like drops the banana at different locations of the shelf. Um, so this, this user choice model that I described here is known as loose choice axiom, and it's a very standard model for ranking found by humans. At the end, what our robot observes is just this thing. It doesn't know which user gave the data. It doesn't even know the probability that that user gave the data. So from our robot's perspective, it knows the user model, and it, it has seen this uh, ranking. So what does it do? We are, again, going to use uh, base rule. So we are going to start with the prior over both alpha and the reward parameters for both of the users. And what we are trying to learn is like, given this ranking, I want to update my posterior about both the data frequency parameter alpha and W1 and W2, the reward function parameters. So on the right, uh, we again have prior, and then we have the likelihood. And this likelihood is just the response model that I described. So I can but mathematically write it as like, there is a chance that this the data came from uh, the first user. And uh, given it's coming from the first user, what's the probability that I get this uh, rank? Or maybe it came from the second user, and then again, the same one. Um, so this is just like alpha one over alpha one and alpha two, two. It's just the data frequency. And then I have this likelihood and the same for the second one. Now I can also replace these because this is just loose choice axiom. Like this is what I did. So I, I got a sample from this distribution and from this distribution. And I repeat for the second user. So like given alpha W1 and W2, I actually have a full expression here. Like I, I can mathematically compute this. So what I'm going to do is given multiple of these ranking queries, the ranking uh, data, I'm going to update my posterior again and again after every query. And at the end of the day, I'm going to learn not only the Ws, but also the data frequency parameter. And like, we tried this on some simulations. So, so this is the first one is with the fed robot. So this is the field simulation, but uh, again, look at the picture here. Task. Uh, the problem is, if we try to model the reward as a unimodal function, what happens is uh, it's very like, sensitive to outliers because it's trying to explain the data with a unimodal reward function. It has many outliers and there are just like, drops. So we had to plot median errors to get some nicer graphs. Uh, but when we model the reward as a mixture, we get better learning performance, but uh, both in terms of the mean and the median. And what is the learning model? Um, so, well, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's not like a neural network. It's not like a parametric model. What we're trying to do is 
we keep all the ranking data and then we update this posterior with all the ranking data and then we take the maximum and posterior uh, estimates from that posterior and then we compare it with the true reward function because this is a simulation we have a true reward function. Okay. Well, you don't learn the parameters you don't have a model to learn for the, for the learning um, so yeah we are learning these w's so you but it's, it's not like yeah it's not like we are not doing three it's not doing that. okay Yeah. So the results are also similar with OpenAI's uh, lunar language. We are again simulating by model rewards here. Yeah, the key takeaway here is that ranking feedback, or more generally, like future forms of feedback, can be used to learn multiple or mixture of reward functions. Uh, and like there are other forms of uh, rich feedback, too. for example, I talked about scale feedback in the beginning, where the user says, I like this trajectory this much more than the other. And for example, that can also be used to learn more general reward functions. And uh, we are not the first people who thought of doing this. Uh, for example, uh, people in DeepMind and OpenAI had this paper on uh, deep reinforcement learning with preferences, where they were able to teach these weird behavior to these simulated robots with uh, comparisons. And then more recently, there is research by researchers at Berkeley, where they again used uh, preference data to uh, use the reinforcement learning to do these uh, learn these forces. But the problem is in all of these works, they had like thousands or tens of thousands of data. In human robot interaction, this is very hard to get because like you cannot have a robot show ten thousand trajectories to the human and then human just sits in front of it and says, Oh, I like this idea. So these are not multi models. Uh, these are not multi models, these are human. And I think it's still impressive that they, they were able to like learn these. Uh, and in, in this case, they were using neural networks. So I think it's still impressive that they were able to learn these policies. But the problem is, yeah, they needed like tens of thousands of data. And we don't have that much data in human robot interaction. So one way we can get this data efficiency is by doing active learning. So we can actually optimize what questions our robot asks to the user so that we can more efficiently learn their rewards. I'm going to talk about this. So, like in driving, they like what about which line separate agent for smooth driving and aggressive driving? I think it's called from unsafe driving. I don't know about the control about this part, but and in that case, they were just learning when to trust which agent. And how does this compare to these ranking calculators? Do you see any advantages of learning the ranking over training different agents and? Learning yeah, I think I think if you have a um I think if you have a like robust separation between these different modes of driving, I think I would go with uh, the work that you described. So I can I can train multiple policies that will be different modes, and I can then try to learn uh, which agent to trust. Uh, but like if the if the data is just like one pool of very large data. And I want to get multiple policies out of this. Then, like, I need some way of clustering these data first, and then I can use these uh, like ranking factor approach to learn these multiple policies from that like one pool of data. It's a matter of knowing which right. is more. Yeah. Like in, in, in the ranking data, one one maybe limitation is that you need to know the no number of modes. Uh, but this is very similar to k-means clustering. Like in k-means clustering, you try different k, and then there's this elbow shape for the error. Yeah. So this is very similar to that. Like you can try different number of modes, and then you're going to get the elbow uh, error, and then at that some point you can train very many different right. <laughs> Yeah. Next, I'm going to talk about active learning to better optimize. Um, so to optimize data efficiency in these uh, learning modes, it can be like learning from pairwise comparisons or ranking. Uh, but my examples are like, my examples are on pairwise comparisons, but they extend to rankings too. So yeah, one thing is very important in learning from comparisons. So when we when we were learning from demonstrations, we had control over nothing. The user demonstrates something to the robot, and the robot just gets it and that's it. But with preference or with comparisons, what happens is first robot Showed some trajectory to the user, and then the user gives a response. So the user actually has some, uh, sorry, the robot has some control over what to show to the user. And based on that, we can actually 
ask better questions to users. And one way to do this uh, was to use maximum volume removal. So what does it do? Uh, we have this posterior, and in maximum volume removal, what we do is we get samples from this uh, posterior, say using centrifugal testings. So only for visualization, let's assume we have only two features, and these are the samples from this posterior. So in maximum volume removal, um, we evaluate how well, how informative one query is as follows. So each of these samples give me a probability that the user chooses the trajectory on the right or trajectory on the left. So for example, in this case, let's say all samples predict I'm going to choose the trajectory on the right. Uh, and with this posterior update, what I'm going to do is if the user really chooses the trajectory on the right, I'm going to reduce the probability of the samples who give uh, more weight to the trajectory on the left. So with this maximum volume removal, what this maximum volume removal says is this query is not very informative because I already predict the user is going to choose trajectory on the right. And if that happens, I'm not going to remove anything from my hypothesis space. So this is not going to give me a lot of information. Instead, if I had a query where the probabilities are like this, then I can actually remove a lot of space from the hypothesis uh, space after the user responds to the query. Because for example, if the user chooses a trajectory on the right, then I can eliminate these uh, samples, these second, fifth, and sixth uh, samples. So I can shrink my hypothesis space faster. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to equally distribute the probability based on the both trajectories. And like when we implement this, uh, it's it outperforms random querying. Uh, so we, so in this case, y-axis is alignment. So it tells us how well the learned reward aligns with the true reward, so higher is better. And you can see that the active uh, active method with volume removal increases data efficiency. But we can actually do better than that. So how do you do that? So we said this query was a better one uh, compared to the previous one. And it could be even better if it were like this, because we would be evenly distributing the probabilities. But let's think of this new query where the robots show two completely identical trajectories to the robots. So all samples will of course predict equal probability of choice because it's just the same trajectory and the user's choice will not reveal anything. But from the maximum volume removals perspective, half of the like distribution is on the left, half of the distribution is on the right. So this is a great query. So in fact, this maximum volume removal objective, this optimization, it has many globally optimal solutions, but some of them are just parallel. And it works in practice only thanks to the local optimal, which is weird because usually you want to find the global optimum and that's like, that's what should be optimal. But yeah, we realized it works only thanks to local optimum and we of course need to change that. So we said we should instead maximize the information and mutual information between the user's response to the query and the parameters we are trying to learn. Conditions on the data sets and the query. So how do we do that? We can equally write it as a difference in two entropy terms. Here the first entropy term models, here the first entropy term models the model uncertainty because it's conditioned on the data we collected so far and the query. And the second one is user uncertainty because it's conditioned on W. So given the user, What's the uncertainty of the user's response? So this is the user uncertainty. If you think about it, we are trying to maximize the model uncertainty. And that makes sense because if my model doesn't know something, I, I should give that to the model. I should teach that to the model. But I also want to minimize the user uncertainty so I, so I can rely on that response. So going back to these examples, like the query on the right, maximizes model uncertainty because half of the distribution is here, half of the distribution is here. But it also minimizes the user uncertainty. Given a user, given a sample, the user is 100% sure of what they're going to choose. So this is a great thing. But if you look at the first one, this also maximizes model uncertainty. My model doesn't know which one I'm going to select. The problem is I also don't know which one I'm going to select. The user uncertainty is also maximized. 
So with this information gain method, we can um, we can even improve uh, further improve data efficiency. And these are some simulation results uh, taken from the same environment that I used in the previous slide. And you can see that information gain uh, performs better than volume removal. In the previous uh, plot, the x-axis was up to 100, and you can see that it's here up to 30. So instead of learning in 130, now we are learning in 30 days. So what are the conditions in the robotic example? Like, like do we know the target location? Do we know obstacles? Like, how does the robot generate those trajectories so, to teach well, to the human? So, so the trajectory generation is completely offline. So you can even create like random trajectories. You can do random things. Yeah. And based on the human's responses, it can actually uh, infer. So uh, it, it creates random trajectories, but each trajectory uh, is accompanied with uh, feature information. So it's a random trajectory, but that trajectory carries information about how close it's up to the target. Oh. Uh, it's, we, are, we are giving it to the we are giving it to the world. So it, it knows the target then, it, in that sense. It, it knows the distance to the target, but it doesn't know that it is a target. Like for example, there's an obstacle too. There's a target too. Okay, it, it knows it, the distance, but it doesn't know the location in X, Y, Z. Okay. It doesn't know the location. And what, what I'm saying is so like there are these multiple objects, right? Mm -hmm. And like the robot does something, yeah. and I tell you that trajectory had a distance of X to this object, Y to this object, Z to this object. How do you tell that? So it's like I'm giving it within the like trajectory data. Okay. But but I'm not saying your target is this. Or like I'm not saying you need to avoid this. And based on the user's responses, it needs to learn like, do I care about this object? Am, am I trying to draw this? Am I trying to avoid something? Or do, does the user want me to go fast? Things like that. So you have several objects on the table, and then robot doesn't know uh, which one is what, and then it tries to randomly approach one of them, and uh, based on the human uh, feedback to it, it will try to learn which one was the main goal. Yes, uh, I mean dur during trajectory generation, it doesn't even try to reach anyone. It does random things. It, it's like complete. Like we have an action space for the robot, like that's the only base of the human. Like it's completely randomized. So how do it you let Eating to the car. It's, it's not a car. Uh, like, not like the blue, blue, blue thing. Yeah. How uh, does it prove, and what prevents it to hit to the blue? Like maybe in the previous slide, I guess. So, yeah. Uh, like during those random trajectories, yeah. it, can, it can collide with the obstacle. But after we show the user, like the human, those trajectories, and the user says, like, I like this other one, which didn't hit the, the obstacle better than this one, which hit the obstacle. But maybe in terms of distance, that hit is like close to the target better than that. Yes. So, yeah, we need to learn that trail. And, like, that's why we need to make these like multiple trajectories. And over time, it's going to learn these, uh, like, the ways for. And this is possible with Turtle Turtle yeah. trial? I mean, it, it of course like depends. Like if you have like, hundreds of objects at the table, then maybe thirty is not enough. Like it, it, it really depends on how many features you have, because like you are trying to learn that trade off between multiple features, and like if you have a hundred of them, maybe like thirty is enough. Like, depending on the uh, feature dimensionality. So we, for example, when the robot ends up at some point, mm -hmm. and you give the distance, you give the vector position. Uh, so no, I, I just on the like endpoint end position to the to the time. Yeah, in, in, huh? in this case, it's just distance. Okay. Well, for example, it's not really visible here, but this is a simulation where like we have a robot trying to uh, toss a ball into one of those baskets. So like the features we give is like how high the ball gets, how fast it goes. Distance to the green basket, distance to the red basket. I buy that, but the other example I don't. Like the one that you showed me, that I can't buy it. I mean, it seems like there's an obstacle there. I don't know. Like that one is like a more like a dynamic trajectory problem, but the one that you have, there's an obstacle in there. So it can hit the obstacle during those like training trajectories. You count that it. as like a failure, for example. Yes, but the robot doesn't know that. Robot doesn't. 
So you stop that when it hits. I mean, you can, but you don't need to because it's, it's, it's just like random trajectory. Like at the end, what happens is like there's a human sits in front of the robot and the human watched two different trajectories. Let's say one of them hits the, the mm -hmm. obstacle, the other one doesn't. And maybe the one that hits the obstacle actually gets to the target, the other one doesn't. Yeah. So that, like that's possible. And the human is going to decide whether it's more important to reach the target or not hit the obstacle. Oh, oh. It's, it's just a human's preference. Like, as, as a human, which one do you want your robot to do? But what's the goal? I mean, what is what is it called to the human? What is it called to the human? So how does he make that preference? Nothing well, is called to the human, or does it have yeah, I mean, some guidance? I mean, you can give some guidance. Like you can say you have this robot at your home. You are trying to train it. So which which trajectory do you prefer? Like if it's a very valuable. So nothing is given in terms of this is hit the, this is never hit the obstacle. No, like, no, no. We, we are, like we are saying. Your users, like you are trying to teach this robot, reach this target, do it. Okay. So which one is in here? The one that we show, like the robotic uh, one, is it back? No. Is yeah, it? this one. So it's like there's this obstacle and then there's this one. Yeah. And this works in purely curve. Uh, in this case, yes, but like we have only like two objects here. I mean, sorry, we have three objects. We have table here, it's just like table, not with an obstacle. Oh, there's no. There's an obstacle. There's no obstacle. There there is Obstacle target and table. The table is also an obstacle. Okay, I guess I'd like to learn more. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Okay. And then, was there any uh, instance that the robot hit the obstacle and still the human learned it? Um, it? It is possible because it's also possible that the, so the robot shows two different trajectories. Right? It's possible that it hits the obstacle in both of them. It's not two different, it's 30 different, you know? No, no, it's like 30 copies. So um, yeah, this is 30 couples, yes. Mm. So it's like 30 pair by comparison trades. Okay, what are these two couples each? I mean. So uh, so we are optimizing those queries based on this optimization. So I have this posterior, right, over W. So for example, on... for uh, a couple, uh, was there some data uh, like this? For example, the robot, although it hit the obstacle, but still the human said, I like it. Yeah, it's possible. And it's even possible that in both of the trajectories it hits the obstacle, and then you need to choose based on for example, how fast it hits. So in each couple, both of them are uh, random decisions made by the well, joint state of the robot. They are coming from a data set that was randomly generated, but from that data set, we are choosing the queries based on this optimization. So like so the queries are optimized to be informed. Every time you're updating. Right after, like after we make have the posterior update, we optimize the next question. Still, it's pretty interesting. There's this uh, other called one called uh, game that you could for. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know. Yeah, yeah. Kind of like how to call, but this one. Yeah. So you get close to the uh, the target object. You say how. And it is a very like a cold kind of thing. I, I think this is like very similar to the event questions game in a way. So in the event questions game, like I like you 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 think of some something, it can be an object, it can be a person, anything. And then I ask you 20 binary questions. Like I ask you, this is a person, you say yes or no. Mm -hmm. I ask you the next question. So it's like depending on what I know until now, oh. I optimize my next question. So okay. that's what our robot is trying to do. That was an application I put on that. So, yeah, we tried this on real robot too. And as you can see, volume removal generates very similar trajectories because it's just trying to maximize the model entry since it doesn't care the user about the user uncertainty. But with the information gain, uh, it actually generates more distinguishable queries, uh, which, are, which are easier for humans. And those are just more efficient because those are more reliable. And this has applications outside robotics too. So in my internship at Google, I worked on these recommender systems. Uh, and the idea was, can we use these preference data in recommender systems? The problem setting is slightly different. So let's say we are trying to do movie recommendations. User still chooses 
their favorites among the slates. So let's say they chose green mild. Uh, so one one thing they can do at that point is they can just go and wash that. That's a, that's a top set determination for us. Or if they say, no, I don't want to watch this. I, I mean, I like this, but I don't want to watch it now. What we do is we ask them whether they want more or less of an attribute. So we ask them, do you want something more funny or less funny? And based on this feedback, we optimize the next question. And there is one important difference too. Uh, and that is, if the user doesn't like our recommendations, they can just terminate the session. They can just leave, uh, which is different in the robotics case because in robotics, we were kind of asking our users to give us data. In this case, the users don't need to do that. So we look at two different things. One is success rate and one is failure rate. So success rate tells us the percentage of users who found a movie within the first 10 uh, recommendations. And failure rates are the percentage of users who left the system within 10 grades. So at Google, they previously considered the expected value of information, which is another information theoretic measure. And they were getting a 38% success rate and 28 uh, failure rate in like with simulated units. If we think about if we think of mutual information, uh, we get better results because mutual information is, is able to get more information from the users. But the problem is mutual information doesn't care about failures. It's just like trying to learn as much from the user as possible. And that means it can also add like bad movies into the set, which is not great. So we create an extended version of the set that we call myopic information gathering. So we add some rooms for asking like better questions and it's improved the success rate. So the big takeaway from this part is we can use this different forms of compressive feedback to actively learn the robot or any kind of objective. And depending on our application, uh, we can change our active learning uh, optimization objective to like, improve the image. And finally, as I said, I want to very briefly talk about the interaction uh, between agents. So like we use these learning and elicitation methods to learn uh, human objectives. Now, can we use this to better optimize our robot in multi-agent systems? And specifically, I'm going to look at multi-agent families. So let's formulate the characteristics of a multi-agent problem. Obviously, we are going to have multiple decentralized agents. And the dynamics will depend on all agents. So in this case, if the robot collapses the tower, it's going to affect my observations too, or forms of observations too. And there's going to be some partial observability. This is needed because if both the robot and I know everything about the system and each other, then I, like we can just use the same policy and it's going to be a, it's going to be like a centralized control that we can believe. So we need some partial observability in the agents to, to make the modify possible. And the policies of each other will be unknown. So the human doesn't know the policy of the robot, the robot doesn't know the policy of the human. And that's actually what we are trying to learn. Like the robot wants to learn the policy of the human so it can better optimize its own actions. So to, to analyze this problem, we decide to simplify it. And what's the simplest form of reinforcement learning problems? Those are probably bandits. So in bandit problems, we have an agent and there are multiple arms. Each arm has a different uh, expected reward. Um, and the agent tries to find the best arm as quickly as possible. But the problem is the standard formulation for bandit, it's, it's for a single agent. So you need to extend it to multiple agents. How do we do that? We have these characteristics. So we said there are going to be multiple decentralized agents. That's easy. Uh, we can have, let's say, two agents. But this is only for visualization. We can have multiple agents. Uh, and we said dynamics will depend on all agents. So in this case, let's say the big octopus is going to choose the row, and the small one is going to choose the column. And then their like joint action is going to be the close now. And then we said there should be partial observability. This is tricky because in bandits, there's only one state. So there's no real partial observability. What, what we can do is we can limit what they know about the environment. So how do we do that? Maybe they sometimes observe the reward and sometimes not. So let's say the small octopus has glasses and it's not able to see the reward always. So they select an arm, let's say the, the 
lead direction that I've got to call it, uh, chooses the top row, and the follower action chooses the right column. So together they chose this arm and it produced a reward. The leader sees it, the follower does. That's the partial observability that they're like that. I mean, the leader can also have partial observability, but it's just how I, how I came. Excuse me. Uh, right now, uh, on the robot scenario, the leader is human and the follower is robot, right? Yes. Um, and then the policies of the, the agents will be out of each one. And formally, um, after every selection, the team gets a team gets a joint reward. But as I said, follower and leader, they may or may not see it based on the partial observability they have. And their goal is to minimize the regrets, which is defined as the difference between the optimal play and the actual play. So there are very standard algorithms for uh, single agent kind of problems. One is upper confidence pump, UCD algorithm. What it does is it keeps a distribution for all arms and it selects the arm with the highest uh, maximum, uh, highest upper confidence pump, uh, which is arm two in this case. And it's proven that this gives a logarithmic regret in the simulation. So if we happen to assume a centralized controller to reduce this to a single agent problem, we would get this nice logarithmic curve. But the problem is, if we let each agent use this UCB in a decentralized way, then this is what happens. We get this linearly increasing regret. Because the problem is the agents are the agents are decentralized. They don't know what the other agent is going to do, and they get stuck at some optimal arms. Let me give you an example. So let's say the leader thinks the top right arm is the best one. A follower has different reward observability. So maybe he thinks uh, the bottom left arm is underexplored. So it wants to like, check that. And what it does is it, it's, it's going to choose the left uh, column. At the end, they're going to end up with this arm that neither of them wants. And the problem is the leader, like after this iteration, after this time step, the leader is still going to think the top right arm is the best one because, I mean, unless we are lucky about this new arm, because like nothing changed about the estimation of this uh, top right arm. And the purple lower, this is definitely underexplored because it was already underexplored and I still didn't explore it, but it's underexplored. So in the next time step, the same thing is going to happen again. And they get, they're going to get stuck at this configuration and that's why they get this linearly increasing regret. So, uh, but, but we showed that with this partner awareness by letting the follower model the leader and act accordingly, we can actually outperform this. So let me give you a like, sketch of our algorithm. So the leader is still going to do UCB as if it's the only player. Uh, and it's going to repeat its action L times. This is only for analysis. In practice, it doesn't need to do that, but for the proof, we need it. Uh, the follower has a more sophisticated algorithm because it's the one who's going to predict the, the leader's action. So what it's going to do is it's going to keep a distribution for the leader's action, action uh, in a frequency way. It's going to predict what the leader is going to do. And based on its prediction, it's going to condition its UCB on. So, I believe the leader is going to choose the top row. So I do UCB only among these two actions. And then I choose my uh, action based on that. And we're going to repeat this like, over this entire horizontal game. And I'm not going to go into the details of the proof, uh, but this is very similar to the proof for standard UCB. Like we, we use Chernoff and union bounds, and we showed that this algorithm that I described is what I think is good. And that's really what happens in the simulation. So we get this nice progressive curve and then it's very close to the blue line here. Blue line is the centralized UCB, so we can think of it as uh, lower bound. And we also did some like uh, human robot studies with this. So uh, as, as I said, human is a leader and robot is a follower. Uh, and they are trying to stack this stack progress here. Like the human has two options, the robot has two options and depending on the order they stack, users like the guests which are simulated like the burger or not so for example if they stack the burger first and then the lettuce and cheese and then tomato maybe four users like it five users dislike it until, until now and they are now preparing the different 
stuff. Uh, and this is a difficult task because if humans, if humans are hard to predict, they're not using UCB, we don't know what they are doing. And, but the robot still needs to predict them and it's still going to use this algorithm that I described. And this is what we get. So even in this very short interaction, partner by UCB was able to outperform my UCB. Um, and we also tried longer interactions with some online studies that up to 1,000 time steps. And the results were similar. We were significantly better than the naive version. And we also did some, like, we also collected some subjective data. So we asked users like, whether they were able to set the browser they wanted or like, whether they used to collaborate, et cetera. And in all of them, the users preferred the partner very robot. In three of them, the comparison tests were very significant. So the takeaway from this part is partner model improves team performance in collaborative uh, multi uh, multi appendix. Of course, we're trying to extend this to the like, MDP settings, uh, to the standard settings, to the simplified version of the MDP. So there's a difference between cooperation and collaboration. So yeah. using collaboration means that you're not really collaborating, you're doing cooperation. Like robot does something, human does something. So can this be a point applied to real collaboration? Like they do something together. Um, in real, because that's that was kind of a real yeah. time kind of action taking and things like that. Yeah, so we have an we have a study again simulation, but what we are trying to do there is there's a driver and then there's a semi-autonomous car. So mm -hmm. the semi-autonomous car can make a corrective action to the driver. So it has its own action set, and the driver can make its own action set, but together they are trying to like make this car. Right. Uh, and in, in that in that case, we again use like these some similar like partner models and ideas. Uh, I, I don't know if you count that as cooperation. I mean, I would use cooperation okay. if I were you because cooperation is like in the H, H, HRI domain, like cooperation is like you do something and the other person mm -hmm. does something. But collaboration is more reserved for something that you are doing together, mm -hmm. like table for example, carrying table right. is collaborative. Right. Okay, yeah, in, in this task, yeah, it's like it's like turn taking, right? Uh, right. But but we don't tell the robot what the human did, otherwise, it would like it would be already conditioned on the human action. So, mathematically, I think it's still collaboration, but the task wise, yes, uh, yeah, task wise, yes. So, the reason I asked whether it can be applied to collaboration is you show, you show the code, you so you need some kind of data accumulator. Right, you need some probability functions. Right. So, how does it gonna work in real time collaboration? Because you know, the, the, the data come from previous time steps. It's not the, it's not what human just did. It's like uh -huh. what human did in maybe like last ten seconds. Okay, but still, like even though in, in that interval, like robot has to do some reaction. Right. Yes. Yes. So that's a little like, bit like yeah. So the robot keep this window of last ten seconds every time. So. It, it does something and then people does something that I'm keeping this 10 seconds. I, I keep doing that. Okay. So a running window. Right. Right. So does it work for like the car example that you do? Like um, it is yes, but it's a, it's, a, it's a very simple example. Like uh -huh. uh, we're considering very simple scenarios because the reason is that it's it's still, like we are still trying to develop this in the MDP setting. So like depending on the car situation, there might be different optimal actions, uh, but like we are not there yet. I talked about these uh, three different ideas. We, we learn users' uh, objectives. We actively learn to increase data efficiency. And then we use those learned models to better interact with humans. But there are still many open challenges, and I want to very briefly talk about them, like three of them. Um, so one is non-stationary rewards. So in the overall, overall problem I, I was trying to solve, I was suggesting uh, there's this human. Human has something in mind. The robot doesn't know that, so we need to first learn it. And then we need to use that learned model to better cooperate with the human. Now, when I say non-stationary rewards, this is really about the first part here. So can we learn non-stationary rewards of the human? For example, in the driving, I was assuming there is this reward function that the human has in mind, and I'm going to learn that. But the problem is the human's reward might be non-stationary. For example, if someone cuts in front of you, you might get more aggressive, and your reward function changes. So can we learn these non-stationary rewards? Uh, one idea is maybe the human has some latent state in mind and we can like 
and, and then the human gives us some information and then we give some reaction and then the human state state changes. So we can maybe model this as a human macro model or partial observable MDP and we can solve that. Okay. I mean, scalability is a problem, but technically or theoretically we can solve that. Uh, the second part is, uh, let's say we are interacting with experts. So here is a video from Predator Research Institute. We are seeing the robots giving a dishwasher. It's only that this is a dishwasher. Uh, using the methods I described so far, it can learn the more optimal it will be dishwasher or it can avoid my, like it can avoid colliding with me. But what I'm suggesting is if it's able to anticipate my actions, for example, if it's able to predict that I need to put some groceries in the fridge, then it can actually learn to do that because it's technically capable of doing it. It just needs to learn then and how to do it. And one way to approach this is maybe we can formulate this a contextual bandits. And human and robot is, uh, human and robot are playing these contextual bandits together, and the robot needs to learn this game as we play. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have teaching. So let's say the robot is interacting with inexperienced users. Uh, can the robot teach those inexperienced users to carve on that? And we are seeing this in some domains. For example, in chess, uh, computers are better than humans for about two decades. And people have started using uh, these chess engines to create better openings or create lessons, create puzzles, etc. Um, and there's also Duolingo, which uses artificial intelligence to learn, uh, teach language. So I'm wondering if we can have similar systems or dynamical systems. So can I have an autonomous or semi-autonomous vehicle that teaches the humans how to drive better? Or uh, can we have a self-balancing system on a bike to teach beginners how to bike uh, safely and efficiently? So overall, I'm suggesting AI agents should be able to anticipate other sections, and this is not going to be helpful only for cooperation is going to be useful for improving both human and robot themselves. With that, I'd like to thank all the faculty and research scientists that I worked with and all the other amazing people with my teaching. Thank you, Adam. Uh, any, any questions from the Zoomers? I have uh, two quick questions if nobody else has any burning questions to ask. Oh, just a second, your, your voice is not. Okay, how about now? Maybe if you can speak up a little bit. You can hear I'm actually uh, sort of yelling. <laughs> my neighbors will complain. Um, I can also write my question. Uh, maybe you can ask that. I, I think I can hear you. Um, so did you perform any uh, sample complexity analysis? on reward learning um, so we, we didn't analytic to do that uh, but there there are many things it depends so one of them is number of uh, number of features that we have in the task so the higher number of features is lower learning uh, and the, the, the other things are for example in some cases multiple different reward functions can encode uh, the same preference depending on the task and in those cases, it's easier to learn the reward function. So, like, we, we do not have a, like, I, I do not have an analytical answer to that question, but I can say that it's, like, it depends on the task a lot. Okay. Um, I have one more question. This is more uh, philosophical. What is the point of learning multimodal rewards? And, you know, what would a, Policy look like if you you know use a multimodal reward like uh, the ones you showed. Yeah, so the the learn policy becomes a mixture of policies. So we are basically learning multiple policies, and then the robot also learns the data I have is like ten percent first policy, thirty percent second policy, and sixty percent the third policy. Uh, so that's that's what it looks like. And the point of learning it is like in some cases. We, like humans have these latent states that we cannot observe. And I still want to learn like, what they are trying to do. For example, in the movie recommendation case, maybe I like horror movies, but let's say I have, let's say I have a kid and he's, he or she is just with me. Then I'm, I'm not going to watch a horror movie. But the problem is Google or Netflix or whoever is doing the recommendation, they don't know I have a kid with me. So 
there are these like multiple different reward functions that I might be optimizing, but there are some latent things in the world that the system doesn't observe. So we are trying to you know, learn this in an unsupervised way. Okay, so it makes more sense to analyze the agents that the uh, whom uh, reward you learn instead of generating an action yourself. Instead of generating what? Instead of actually using the policy from the multimodal reward. Right, right. Uh, okay. Yeah, so like at the end we learn like different individual policies and then depending on the situation we can select one of them. Okay, so this uh, is sort of like similar to Fatma's uh, question. Um, like, can you really, from the multimodal reward, how can you learn uh, separate policies? It's more like you learn each policy for each trajectory. Uh, and then you sort of, it's like, it becomes too uh, trajectory dependent, right? And what if you have, uh, multiple trajectories that are very similar. So there's sort of like this, I feel um, certain issues with using multimodal rewards. Uh, so, okay, when you say multiple trajectories that are similar, like just to clarify, uh, mm -hmm. are we talking about the ranking queries or are you saying there are like multiple modes, but those modes are just very similar? Multiple modes that are very similar, just right. demonstrations, not queries. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. If, if, if there are multiple modes and if they're very similar, then yeah, it, it gets harder to learn because you first need to shrink all the space down to where those two modes are. And then you need to like learn to separate them. You need to learn to differentiate between them. So yeah, it becomes really difficult if modes are very close to each other. It's theoretically still possible, but you will need more data than like theory of these degrees. So what I wanted to come uh, at is like, instead of learning policies, you can do more, maybe, I mean, this is just like a uh, hypothesis, do more planning stuff rather than just learning a single policy and perhaps try to uh, figure out what the user might prefer, you know, among multiple ones sort of thing. Like it, I think fits better with recommendation, I think. And uh, I really like this for recommendation. Uh, more so than robotics, but yeah. I mean, great work overall. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't fully follow the planning suggestion, but yeah, maybe we can discuss that offline. Sure, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Well, thank you too. Any other questions? Thank you very much for this presentation. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah. We have time, I don't know.